<clears throat> so today, we're at the 25th Sunday of the year. And it's a parable that um, surprises a lot of people because it seems that uh, Jesus is praising the work of a thief. And he's doing no such thing, but um, he speaks, you know, ironically. We'll see that when we get there. But um, I'd like to take this gospel in two parts. First of all, there's the analysis of a sinner, and then there is the, um, the advice to the saints. All right. In looking at the analysis of the sinner, uh, we look first to there's the delusion of the sinner. Um, it says here in the text, Jesus said to his disciples, a rich man had a steward. Now, this is important because we are often forgetful that we own nothing vis-a-vis -vis God. You know, I might have property, you might have property that's yours vis-a-vis -vis me or you, but at the end of the day, before God, it's all his. And we're simply stewards. Now, the difference between an owner and a steward is the owner, in a certain sense, can do what he wants with what he owns. But a steward is expected to take care of the thing or property or what have you in a way that would please the master, uh, or the owner, I should say, and then would... Um, maybe even help advance the cause of the of the owner. Now, we are, as I say, vis-a-vis -vis God, we are stewards. So our job is to use the things he's entrusted to us to advance the kingdom in our own soul and heart and also the souls and hearts of people we know and love, indeed the whole world. So we see that uh, there, if we think that we own things, we're deluded. Uh, we are, there's a delusion upon us that's... Uh, that people are forgetful that God is the rightful owner. Here's some scriptures, you know, if you want them. Uh, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwell therein. So again, God owns everything. It's all his, the entire earth and all that's in it and all who are in it, including you and me. There's a lot of, you know, this shrill stuff today, like my body, my choice, you know. <clears throat> you know, it isn't your body. It's not my body. It's the Lord. So it says you have been, uh, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you have been purchased and at a price. So glorify God in your bodies. So again, that's in uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19 and following. <clears throat> so forgetful, though, of uh, the fact that we are more the stewards than the owners of things, we, we ought to remember always that we're going to have to account to the Lord, and uh, we'll see that in a moment. And um, that we ought to be using things in a way that pleases him. Um, now, um, we see next, so the delusion of the sinner, who could be us, this is, not, this is not just some historical figure in a parable, but, you know, this could be us, the sinner. Um, we're very quickly forgetful that everything we have, including our bodies, you know, belongs to God. And, um, all right. Otherwise, we're deluded. So there's the delusion of the sinner. Then comes the dissipation of the sinner. It says, now this, this steward was reported to his master for squandering his property. Now, the, in, in, in this aspect, uh, he's squandering, or that is to say dissipating, diminishing the, the property of the owner. Um, and um, so this is what we, we, we see again not just about some figure in a parable 2,000 years ago, but we too can dissipate the things that God has given us, the things of the world, our time, our talent, our treasures, and so on, all the gifts we have, like of speech, and so on. So, for example, in greed, we hoard things that God gave us really for the purpose of helping others, starting, of course, with family, children, and so on, but not ending there. Um, we ought to do the best we can to help the needy and the poor. And uh, so the Lord intends for our excesses, you know, to go to the poor, the needy, um, the sick or the suffering, all right? Um, this is not just about money, it's about time, it's about talent, it's about other gifts. For example, the gift of speech, you know, when, um, um, you know, when we, um, God gave us the gift of speech to speak truth to one another, but when we, um, when we um, gossip or lie or curse, and we're misusing the gift of speech. We're dissipating or squandering the kingdom, okay? Causing harm to the kingdom of God. Um, in laziness, we misuse the gift of our time and, again, our talents that God gave us for some help in building up the kingdom, starting with our own soul and heart, all right? Um, 
Just, frankly, all sin is an abuse of the freedom that God gave us, right? So what we want to see is that um, this is uh, the, the, the dissipation um, of, of the sinner, all right? Now, we see in the delusion of the sinner. He thinks it all belongs to him. He doesn't, you know, okay? We see the dissipation of the sinner. And then the third thing I would just want to say before we move on to the advice to the saints is the death of the sinner. So... The master summons the steward and says, What's this I hear about you? Prepare a full account of your stewardship because you can no longer be my steward. Now, again, this is where the Lord says to us, Look, you know, there's going to be a day when you die and you can't be my steward anymore. <laughs> you have to now come and render an account for what you've done with the gifts I put in your care, including your very life, your gifts, your time, your talent, all the other things that go that I've given you, everything from your speech to your strength to... Well, again, your intellect, your will, your mind, your heart, and so on. So um, he summons him. Now, um, St. Paul says to us, again, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and we must render an account for what we have done in the body, whether good or ill. Whether good or ill. So with that in mind, we, we have this, um, this summons to recall that we're going to die and have to render an account in the judgment seat. So St. Paul says, because of that, whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. All right. So again, we, uh, we need to know that one day our stewardship will come to an end. And hopefully we'll be able to render a good account. Um, but again, in terms of describing the sinner, we'll see that unfortunately he'll have a lot of dissipation he'll have to report to. All right. So um, there's a, another scene of this in the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter. It says, the books were opened. A book was opened, uh, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. So we see that we're judged according to how we use the gifts that God has given us. Um, there's another maybe quick reading from the book of Sirach that might be helpful here too. This is from Sirach in the fifth chapter. Say not, I have sinned, what, but what's befallen me? For the Lord bides his time. And of forgiveness be not overconfident, adding sin upon sin. And say not, oh, great is his mercy. My many sins he will forgive, for mercy and anger are alike with him. And upon, upon the wicked alights his wrath. Delay then not your conversion to the Lord. Put it not off from day to day. For suddenly his wrath flames forth, and the time of vengeance you'll be destroyed. So again, this is to, for those who are presumptuous. Uh, we think, well, you know, I just got to forgive everything, and uh, I don't really need to worry about rendering an account. Well, sorry. Uh, so again, this line from the scripture today says, the master summons this dishonest steward and says, what's this I hear about you? Prepare an accounting of your stewardship, because you can no longer be my steward. And so we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, so, in the meantime, the Lord doesn't just warn us of the, uh, of the sinner, but also it gives him advice uh, to the saints. And uh, we'll see, first of all, is this principle of intensity. Now, since uh, I didn't read the gospel at the beginning, I will read this section to you, but you know it well, I hope. The steward said to himself after he was told you have to render account, what shall I do now that I'm, my master is taking the position of steward away from me? What shall I do? I'm not strong enough to dig ditches. I'm ashamed to beg. Ah, I know what I will do so that when I'm removed from the stewardship, they may, and they may welcome me into their homes. So he called his master's debtors in one by one. And to the first, he said, how much do you owe my master? He replied, 100 measures of olive oil. He said to him, here's your promissory note. Sit down and quickly write one for 50. Then to another, the steward said, how much do you owe? He said, 100 cords of wheat. And the steward said to him, here's your promissory note. Write one down for 80. And the master then commended this dishonest steward for acting shrewdly. For the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of the light. Now, again, the Lord is not telling this story to praise the guy for being a thief, but rather it's the principle of intensity that the Lord is speaking to. And he speaks quite ironically. It's just dripping with irony. He says how the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own than are the children of light. 
Mm. And how true that can be. You know, the wicked are dedicated. Um, they, they work hard at spreading the wickedness. Um, it's um, quite an industry, we might say. And uh, there yet, uh, you know, too many of the faithful can hardly rouse themselves to go to Mass on Sunday and complain at the slightest holy day or obligation or at the obligation to pray and, and so on. And like, you know, are the, are the children of the light. And, and meanwhile, the wicked are filled with all and sorts of intensity. Hmm? And um, there's a sleepiness from the saints and a dedication to the devilish. And uh, the Lord says, how sad this is, you know. Um, how is it that the wicked can be so conniving, so shrewd, and you're just like, oh, 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 what are the, you know, what are the, you know, corporal works of mercy? Oh, no. Uh, you know, we're just kind of out to lunch on it. Now, not everybody, but this is a kind of a collective problem. So the Lord is uh, saying, first, you need to be as intense and as dedicated to the kingdom of God and to holiness as the wicked are to this world and to their wickedness. So he's not approving, but he's saying, this. look at this guy. See how intense he is. And you can barely get out of bed on Sunday morning to go to Mass. Okay. So we start to see that um, the first is the principle of intensity. The second is the principle, and then it's advice to the saints, uh, the principle of investment. He says, make friends for yourself. So I, so I tell you, says the Lord, make friends for yourselves with dishonest wealth so that when it fails, you may be welcomed into eternal dwelling. Well, well first of all, we might wonder at the, what is meant by dishonest wealth. I mean, I worked hard for it. I, I earned it. It's not, I didn't steal it. Um, what I think the Lord means here is that we live in a very unjust world in terms of the distribution of goods. And some regions, such as in America here, we live very, very well. And um, other people in the world, not even far off our coast, like places like Haiti, or some places down in Central and South America, they don't live nearly as well. Think of Indonesia and some of the regions there. Uh, think, of, um, think of them. And, you know, how can I buy a pretty inexpensive shirt at the Kmart or wherever? Well, probably because a kid in a sweatshop in Indonesia is getting a dollar or two a day. Now, I can't change that, and you can't change that. I'm not talking about some new big government program. I'm talking about just the Lord is saying, you know, you ought to befriend the poor. And you're smart if you do it. It's like investing. Principle of investment, because you put money in their hands, or not just money, but your time, your talent. You care for them. And um, they have no way of repaying you, so they just commit it to God. And you store up treasure for yourselves in heaven, says the Lord. And uh, so that on the day of the judgment, says, uh, make friends for yourself with your dishonest wealth. So the Lord is pointing out there, there's a kind of an injustice. Not that we're personally responsible for it or really can do much about it. I bet you the kid in the sweatshop say, I know it's dishonest, but do it anyway, because I could use the dollar or, do dollar or two a day. But I don't, so I'm not here to say, but it's dishonest in the sense that there's such inequality uh, in the world. So remember the poor. And you may not be able to send money to the poor guy in Indonesia, but uh, you can remember the poor who are nearby. You know, All right. So this is um, a certain sense of why he calls it dishonest wealth. But he also goes on to say that, so that when your wealth fails you, and it will, none of us can buy our way out of death. We might be able to postpone it a little, but we can't really buy our way out of it. And we can't take it with us. So make friends. You, through your use of your wealth, so that when it fails you, they, namely the poor you've helped, the needy, not just strangers, but maybe some of your family and friends, they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. It's pretty nice to think that when you're going to the judgment seat to render an account, you might have someone calling from out on the edges saying, Lord, be good to this one. He was good to us. That's not a bad, a bad attest, you know, testament on your behalf. When you go to the judgment seat, and the Lord hears the cry of the poor. So, the Lord's saying, be smart. Be smart with how you use the gifts I've given you. Not just your money, but your, your strength. Um, you know, every now and again, like, I've, I've lost a lot of physical strength in my 60s. In a way I never dreamt of, I now depend on younger people to really move tables and chairs and things that I can do a little bit of, but I, I don't have the strength. I can't climb high ladders anymore. I'm too unstable, you know. I don't mean to sound older than I am, but... 
I just know as I get older, I really need the strength of younger people to help. And um, thanks be to God, some of them have it, like I used to. <laughs> so, um, so things like your strength, your health, uh, use uh, your obviously your money and your time, your your talents. Um, maybe uh, you can't give a lot of money, but you can assist somebody by tutoring or uh, etc. You know, working uh, working in some capacity to help others, whether in the parish or in some other organization. So, principle of investment is you know, use your money wisely. Use your time, your talent, your treasure, the gifts I've given you. Use it wisely, and in so doing, you'll store up treasure in heaven, which uh, it will be waiting for you. Because all the rest of the stuff. You know, these trinkets you're going to leave behind. Of course, it's not money waiting for us in heaven, but it's, you know, as the book of Revelation says, let the, de let the dead rest from their labors, for their good deeds go with them. Somebody says, you know, you can't take it with you. Well, you yeah, but you can send it on ahead. <laughs> Which is to say that in giving, ironically, the way we keep something unto eternal life is by dispensing or dispersing it, you see. So we see then that there's this advice to the sinners. That first of all, the principle of intensity, then the principle of investment. The next thing that we, we, we see here um, is, is the, um, uh, the principle of increase. So the Lord says, look, if you're trustworthy in a small matter, like say money or how you use the gifts I've already given you, if you're trustworthy in a small matter, um, you'll also be trustworthy in great ones. And the person who is dishonest in small matters uh, is also dishonest in great ones. If, therefore, you're not trustworthy with, uh, with dishonest wealth, who will trust you with true wealth? And if you are not trustworthy in what belongs to another, who will give you, give you what is yours? See? Who will give you what is yours? So, again, basically the Lord is saying, now look, if I can trust you to make good use of the gifts I've given you, I can trust you with bigger things, you know, uh, bigger things than either money or uh, all these other things, but bigger things like, uh, you know, bigger tasks, bigger, bigger things that um, gifts like wisdom, counsel, understanding, knowledge, deliverance from some of the things. You know, I have to permit some troubles in your life to keep you humble, but maybe if I start to see you're living more humbly, I can trust you with greater things, greater health and so on. So you see... The Lord is saying, "If you, I won't be outdone in generosity. You be generous to others, and I'll be even more generous to you, because I can trust you with my gifts." We finally come to the uh, to the principle of indivisibility. Comes this final warning. He says, "No servant can serve two masters. Either they'll hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other." But we keep trying to disprove this. <laughs> we think we can serve both the world and God. And the Lord's saying, not really, no. Now look, the Lord knows you and I, we need a job. We need some things to, you know, sustain us. And uh, But what he's talking about here is that, again, when you start to turn your, all your attention and time to worldly things and toys and trinkets of this world, it's a bad deal. And... Um, you, you end up serving it and, and making compromises and doing all these things because you have, quote, too much to lose, too many assets, too many things are on the table if you don't go along with the world's demands. And um, even the things you've already owned, you know, now I need service or maintenance on it. I need uh, insurance, you know, uh, you know, there's all these kinds of things, you know. I mean, I, I've been a pastor for many years now, and I can tell you these beautiful church buildings are very expensive to maintain, <laughs> and they're beautiful, and I'm glad we have them. But you know, you got to repair the roofs, you got to have the insurance, you got to make sure that the maintenance is done, and on and on. I could go, and um, thanks be to God, I've got a good staff. But I will tell you that um, these things do eat up a lot of time if you're not careful. If I'm not careful, and so the Lord says, you know, you think you can go ahead and take care of all that stuff, and you're still going to have time left over for me, but. You know how it works. You know, oh, Lord, I've been so busy today. In other words, read between the lines, running after the things of this world and taking care of them that I just didn't have time to pray. I'm just too tired. You know, things, small things like that and bigger things behind, besides where people make real compromises with evil uh, to get ahead in the world. Or they make, they remain silent when they should speak out against error and sin. And uh, that's, that's much bigger. And so again, 
these are things that we want to keep in mind uh, that the indivisibility, ultimately our hearts are going to either serve the world or the Lord. And uh, although the Lord knows we need some truck in this world to get through and get some resources to live, at the end of the day, um, not so much that uh, we deny something far more important, which is the fact that we really want to serve him. And if getting a job and raising a family and praying for some of their uh, creature need, comforts and needs is part of his will for you, good. But if that's, if that's what you become dedicated to, you know, you and I, we quickly lose our way. So he's warning us. So some advice to the saints, all right? And just to review what they were, again, we, we see that uh, there was a principle of intensity to be as shrewd and, you know, um, in dealing with the things of this world as the wicked are. You know, as shrewd as dealing with our spiritual life as the wicked are with uh, the sinfulness and the things of this world, all right? They, they know how to get what they want, and they know how to kind of push their wickedness on others, and they're very dedicated. So, uh, principle of intensity, the principle of investment. So, look, make use of the gifts I've already given you, and if I can trust you with smaller things, I'll give you greater things. But if you're not even using well the gifts I've already given you, why should I entrust you with more? You're, many of you are parents, or we've all certainly been children, I mean, but it wouldn't make sense after a while for a parent to give uh, money to a, an adult child who was uh, a ne'er-do-well. Uh, he'd probably just take it and spend it on something not helpful. And so again, there comes a moment when, you know, if you can't even use what I've already given you, and you or you misuse it, I can't trust you with things like wealth. So I won't give it. So that's how we sometimes are before God. He really can't trust us. And uh, I, g I gave you the gift of speech, but look how you misuse it. You know, you say, praise the Lord one day, and the next day you're cursing people made in his image, says the book of James. So there's also then the principle of increase. You know, again, the Lord says, again, I, I, I need to know that uh, I want you to be wise, to have good investment, use your gifts for the gifts of others. The principle of increase, in other words, also, where uh, the Lord will reward us with greater things if we've done well with lesser things. And then finally, the principle of indivisibility, namely, you can't really decide who you're going to serve. Are you and I, is our first goal to please the Lord, or is it to please ourselves or other human beings? Now, be honest for a minute. I mean, as I must be. The answer isn't always the one we want it to be. And so, I leave that with you. I, I would say that uh, this last thing can be very hard for us, and... Uh, what we really need to ask the Lord for is a conversion of our desires so that we have a greater desire to please him and less of an obsession with having the world and things in it and, and having people like us and, you know, we're so obsessed, we're so afraid of being rejected. And so we ask to ask the Lord to really help us with that because otherwise we're going to be serving the world, not God. So we have to go before God like blind beggars with something like this. This isn't something we're just going to say, oh, I read this in the Bible, now I'll get everything in good order. It's not that simple, and you know it and I know it. But we can go to God and say, I, I'm a blind beggar. I, I don't exactly know where to begin. But you go to work in my heart and give me some greater detachment and a better sense of my priorities and help me to more increasingly understand to be shrewd like that wicked guy was, but to be shrewd in holiness so that I'm doing things I know that please you because I want to please you. I don't want to serve God and man, but I can't. I know what I'll be really serving. Help me only to want to serve you. You say, well, I'll never get there. Many have. And um, I can just say that you and I, we ought to at least ask and go before him like blind beggars. So today, we want to think on being faithful in a few things before becoming ruler of many. And the Lord gives us some good advice to the saints today. All right, God bless you, and we'll talk to you next week, I hope. God willing, and the creeks don't rise.